Dzień dobry. Witam Państwa serdecznie na seminarium naukowym Instytutu Pileckiego. Nazywam się Emilia Dziewiecka i jestem pracownikiem Ośrodka Badań nad Totalitaryzmami. Na wstępie chciałabym zaznaczyć, że nasze dzisiejsze seminarium odbędzie się w języku angielskim. Dzisiaj seminarium w nieco zmienionej formule, nie ma koreferenta, natomiast naszym gościem jest pani Lia Walton Erwin, doktorantka zajmująca się historią Europy Wschodniej i przygotowująca rozprawę doktorską na Indiana University Bloomington. Obecnie pani Walton Erwin przebywa w Warszawie, gdzie prowadzi badania do swojego doktoratu w ramach programu Fulbright Hayes i przedstawi zagadnienie handel polsko-austriacki i modernizacja konsumpcji w Polsce po 1989 roku. Te zagadnienia, o których będzie dzisiaj mowa, one również oczywiście zostaną ujęte w rozprawie doktorskiej, która będzie poruszała jeszcze tutaj szerszą gamę zagadnień. Zachęcam Państwa do zadawania pytań. Proszę wpisywać je w przestrzeni questions and answers, również w dolnym pasku. Po wystąpieniu naszej prelegentki, naszego gościa skupimy się właśnie na pytaniach i mam nadzieję na ciekawą dyskusję. A teraz już oddaję głos pani Lia Woltin Erwin. Dziękuję, Emilia. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much to Christian, Emilia, and uh, the translation team and to the Pilecki Institute for having me here today. As a disclaimer, I have indeed just arrived in Warsaw and uh, for three months of archival and library research, and am therefore in the early stages of the project uh, that I will present today. I therefore especially appreciate your flexibility in accommodating a shorter and more informal lecture today focused more on my approach and plans and on any particular findings. I do hope to be able to join you all again in the future for a more extended talk on those findings. <clears throat> Today I will discuss a section from my dissertation focusing on my methods, engagement with existing literature, and the source material I plan to gather while in Poland this spring. This section deals with the networks of commerce and trade between Austria and Poland forged prior to 1989, which garnered Austria a strong presence as an investor early on after the fall of communism, a legacy which has been obscured by the subsequent ascendance of French and German chains such as Carrefour, Auchan, Lidl, and Kaufland, which will be familiar to many of you in the audience. I argue that these Cold War era ties were instrumental in building greater East-West economic entanglement from the Western European perspective, but also as a crucial foundation from which systems of economic power and political influence in post-socialist Poland emerged and solidified in the decade prior to the formal enlargement of the European Union. To start, I will give an overview of my larger dissertation project to establish some of the major themes and frameworks that my research interrogates. The project is entitled The Shop Across the Border, Western European Retail and the Making of Post-Communist Supermarkets in Eastern Europe, 1989 to 1999, <clears throat> and analyzes foreign-owned supermarkets as an early arena of interaction, discovery, an exchange between East and West after 1989. Both the Western preoccupation with perceived consumer deprivation and the inhibiting of entrepreneurs in state socialism, as well as the Eastern European familiarity and interest in Western goods gave material consumption a highly symbolic as well as a concrete importance to both the fall of socialism and the introduction of capitalism. In turn, the oversaturated and competitive markets in Western Europe and desire for economic modernization in Eastern Europe encouraged a strategic reliance on eastward commercial expansion on both sides. <clears throat> I argue that these factors rendered supermarkets a highly symbolic and robust site in which a variety of actors imagined and enacted new economic and cultural systems in the early post-socialist period. <clears throat> 
To tell this story, I employ three case studies representing Western European chains, which made public claims to being the first foreign owned self-service supermarkets in three post-socialist countries. In East Germany, I use the West German Spar chain, a subsidiary of the Dutch corporation, which many of you may know in its local variation, which opened its first storefront in East Germany in March of 1990. In Poland, as I will discuss today, I analyzed the case of Bila, a relatively small venture between the Austrian supermarket chain, a Vienna-based trading company operated by two Polish businessmen in exile, <clears throat> and a company based in Poland. Bila Polen, as the joint venture was called, opened its first Polish shop in December 1990 and existed in a relatively stable form until the chain was purchased by the German corporation Reva in 1996. Lastly, I explore the story of the German corporation Metro in Romania, which opened a cash and carry wholesale shop in Bucharest in 1996, the first major foreign retailer to enter Romania. <clears throat> This regional approach allows me to see how Western European commercial expansion eastward unfolded in a series of consecutive phases with a surprisingly straightforward directionality. To understand this, I adapt ideas such as embeddedness and psychic distance, which are used in the existing literature from business studies and economic geography as evidence of the rational pragmatism of multinational firms expanding into culturally close markets first. By contrast, I argue that geographically phased expansion replicated and reified hierarchical understandings of Europe, which ran counter to emerging discourses of supranational European unity. <clears throat> These phases or waves, as they are often referred to in the social science literature, anticipated European integration and EU expansion, thus forming, forming what some have called the commercial integration of Eastern Europe prime, prior to formal accession, but in practice also establishing an economic hierarchy that mapped directly onto existing notions, which used Easternness as a measure of backwardness and difference relative to the West. Also important to note here is the frequent exclusion of East Germany from many social science analyses of Western European commercial expansion into the post-socialist region, obscuring both the commonalities between the East German experience and that of its neighbors, as well as the important ways in which it was different precisely because of its geographic and cultural proximity to West Germany. I thereby contribute to the body of research in history and geography, illuminating the ambiguous or liminal positionality of Eastern Europe in the Western European imagination and the longer historical pattern by which Western Europe has and continues to construct itself as a guide and savior vis-a-vis -vis an Eastern European backward, but crucially potentially salvageable semi-other often using supposedly modern standards of capitalist commerce and consumer culture to make these claims. In particular, I build upon analyses that map Eastern Europe's constituent subregions onto a Western European hegemonic system structured around perceived degrees of economic and cultural familiarity or foreignness, asking how culturally situated geographic categories such as, for example, Germany, Central Europe, the Balkans, and so on, influenced and were strengthened by phased commercial expansion. I use a variety of materials to show how competing ideas about the relative familiarity and foreignness of various parts of the post-socialist region shaped commercial ventures, not least as a means of justifying profit-oriented activities. Whereas SPAR promoted its activities in East Germany, including its partnership with the East German trade organization HO, H -O, as an act of neighborliness, West German discourse also frequently relied on exoticizing tropes of consumer naivete and other markers of difference to justify West German intervention into retail in the East. I am conducting a number of interviews with former supermarket executives, store managers, and shop employees to better understand how individual actors within this process made sense of their positionalities vis-a-vis -vis one another. 
As shown here, Spar's mar marketing director expressed his impression that East Germans, despite sharing a common language and not so different history, were fundamentally unknown to and different from West Germans. Similar tensions characterized Metro's messaging in Romania, although proclaiming its cash and carry style wholesale shops as an offer of partnership, collaboration, and support for Romanian entrepreneurs. Metro also published advertisements such as this one, which imagined shops, its shops as a transformative force marking a major rupture in Romanian consumer culture, juxtaposing pastoral images of a disorganized outdoor markets with the warehouse sized inventory and long straight aisles of the Metro shops, perpetuated unnuanced notions of economic backwardness in the post-socialist region, justifying a Western economic presence. The dissertation comprises six chapters divided into three chronological case studies. After an introduction contextualizing the opening of the Eastern Bloc within the larger historical process of retail globalization after the Second World War, part one examines SPAR's expansion into East Germany and then presents a discourse analysis of the West German business press's role in designating East German consumers as other or semi-other prior to formal reunification focusing on its routine juxtaposition of Eastern shoppers and Western supermarket executives, as well as consumer naivete within modern retail settings on both sides of the border. Part two, which I will discuss in greater, greater depth shortly, argues for greater recognition of Austrian investment as a means of understanding how pre-1989 networks of commerce and trade helped to shape the Polish economic order after 1989. I also analyzed the emerging Polish independent press to show how regular coverage of Western retail models functioned as a means of demonstrating authenticity, honesty, and reliability among Polish journalists. Finally, part three interrogates Western retail investors' contribution to an imagining of integrated Europe, which nominally privileged individual initiative and local entrepreneurship but actually encouraged the consolidation and expansion of foreign owned multinational corporations, as well as one in which multilingual and transnational labor was applauded, but also represented greater vulnerability for Eastern European workers. I conclude by arguing that supermarkets functioned as a kind of vanguard of European integration, forging key links of not only commerce and capital, but also culture, thus constituting a key arena in which ideas about belonging in post-Cold War Europe were hashed out. Now, to dive a bit deeper into the Polish dimensions of this project, I'd like to highlight some of the key interventions that I'm hoping to make within the existing literatures. First, although scholars of retail internationalization in Europe in initially emphasized the dominant role played by Austrian retailers in the early post-socialist period. More recent work overlooks this due to a subsequent ascendance of other Western European actors. In 1990, about 40% of all foreign direct investment in Eastern Europe came from Austria. By 1994, 30% of food retail operations in Eastern Europe were Austrian, it was second only to Germany in terms of investment in the region, despite being a tenth the size of reunified Germany with an eighth of its GDP. Over time, however, Western European retail became increasingly consolidated and competitive, producing the French and, Ger and German dominated landscapes of foreign owned retail in Poland and its neighbors today. The small body of literature that does acknowledge the Austrian presence in Poland and its immediate neighbors frequently alluded to a shared regional history of imperial entanglement as the chief factor propelling Austrian commercial actors to early success as investors. Economist and business scholar Franz Schuttling, for example, argued in 1997 that Austria's, quote, faster reaction is probably due to Austria's special role in this part of Europe, end quote, explaining how, quote, the opening of Eastern Europe reconnects areas which under the Habsburg monarchy were once economically and politically integrated, but were almost completely separated by an iron curtain in most of the post-war period. Similarly, historical allusions appeared throughout contemporaneous media reports on the rapid expansion of Austrian retail into, the, into its neighbors in the former bloc, 
notably bypassing the atrocities of the mid 20th century to emphasize more sympathetic relations between the countries at Europe's geographic center. In February 1993, the German newspaper Der Spiegel referred to Austrian successes in the East as a new Grundzeit, referencing the period of economic reform in the Habsburg Empire in the mid 19th century. Quote, the Alpine Republic conquered the East with a business mindedness reminiscent of the Habsburgs, remarked the paper, noting the successes of Austrian retail chains, including Vila, operating across Eastern Europe. Such analyses, journalistic and scholarly, often portrayed imperial ties as part of a supposedly natural or organic regional entanglement disrupted by the antagonisms of the Cold War, in turn, hardly mentioning the impact of the world wars at all. This interest in Austria's purportedly renewed economic engagement with the post-socialist region also produced a particular imagining of Eastern Europe's so-called return to Europe after 89, as in part taking place through eastward homecomings via Austria, where many Eastern Europeans in exile took up residence during the Cold War. The same Der Spiegel article invoked the experiences of Eastern Europeans in Austria who returned to their countries of origin after 89 to reclaim lost property, including commercial businesses, representing the Cold War as an abnormal deviation from an otherwise natural regional economic environment. These portrayals conceptualized Austria and Vienna in particular as a transit point by which Eastern Europeans not only returned home to Eastern Europe, but paradoxically also initiated their region's return to Europe by way of the reintroduction of old networks of commerce and trade. In fact, trade between Eastern Europe and Western Europe had continued throughout the Cold War period as numerous studies of Poles and others who crossed the Iron Curtain in pursuit of Western goods has shown. As Dariusz Stola has argued, this mobility is crucial to understanding late socialism because, quote, international for-profit mobility resulted from and contributed to the erosion of three sets of policies essential to the communist regime, the control of exit, the suppression of markets and private business, and isolation from the capitalist West. However, this literature has primarily focused on lower income migrants and consequently has obscured the Cold War era ties between more elite Polish migrants and prominent commercial actors such as large supermarket chains in the West. And yet, as some contemporaneous observers noted, Cold War era commercial ties between East and West and between Austria and so-called Central Europe in particular proved vital to Austrian commercial successes in the early post-socialist period. Bila Poland, as the joint venture between the Austria su Austrian supermarket chain Bila and its two partner companies was called, was the product of precisely these Cold War commercial ties. Not only were Polish consumers familiar with Bila's products and those of the Western European supermarket more generally, due to the porous nature of the so-called Iron Curtain, but so too were Austrian commercial actors who sought profits in Eastern Europe, the beneficiaries of transnational arrangements which had emerged despite the constraints of the Cold War. In the example of Bila's primary partner in its venture in Poland, the import-export company Polmark, I find an example of two such actors who forged commercial ties between Poland and Austria during the Cold War, allowing them not only to contribute to the modernization and internationalization of retail in Poland, but also to position themselves in influential roles within the post-socialist political and economic landscapes. Likely known to members of this audience for their proximity to a series of political and economic corruption allegations in the 1990s and 2000s, the Polmark founders are less commonly discussed in terms of their contribution to the making of modern retail in Poland. Yet I argue that when seen in historical perspective, there are no numerous cross-border economic activities both before and after 1989 allows us greater insight into the importance of transnational mobility in forging the multinational retail landscapes of contemporary Eastern Europe. Leaving analysis of post-socialist corruption for scholars with better suited expertise than me, 
I instead focus on the position of a multinational company such as Bila within the changing Polish economic landscape in the 1990s and what that can help us understand about the shifting meanings attached to transnationalism in the context of European integration. Born in Poland in the early 1950s, Andrzej Kuna and Alexander Zagiel, the Polmark founders, emigrated from Poland to Austria in the late 1960s. There they embarked upon a range of business ventures, eventually forming the import-export business Polmark, headquartered in Vienna, but particularly focused on bringing goods to Poland. Their continued ties to Poland positioned the pair to put their connections with prominent political and economic players in both countries to good use amidst economic opening after 1989. In the early summer of 1990, Polmark initiated a joint venture with the Austrian supermarket chain Bila. In its first years of operation, Bila Poland boasted numerous successes, opening two supermarkets in Warsaw, as well as a number of stores in smaller cities. In turn, the Polmark founders were consistently ranked, usually as a pair, among the richest Poles by the newspaper Wyprost throughout the early 1990s. Over time, these activities garnered the pair an almost mythological re reputation in their native Poland and beyond as proven experts in the dawning era of transnational capitalism. In November 2004, the Polish news magazine Polityka attempted a profile of the notoriously private and elusive duo, writing, quote, at once in Vienna and in in Warsaw, Vienna from Friday evening to Tuesday morning, Warsaw from Tuesday evening to Friday afternoon. A steady rhythm, business in Poland, weekend rest in Austria. Citizens of the world, Kuna has Polish and Austrian passports, Jagiel has Polish and German. While the Eastern expansion of Western corporations is a regular subject of transformation studies, Studies of the, uh, rel of the westward mobility of Eastern Europeans primarily focuses on low income labor migrants, thus obscuring the history of high profile economic actors who moved across borders during this period. Yet, as you see here, contemporary commentators, especially in the Polish press, often highlighted the pair's connection to Bila, illuminating the entangled relationship between symbols of westernization and prosperity and the emerging networks of power and influence in the post-socialist region in public perception. For these chapters, I draw upon a variety of archival and published materials. Archivum Aknowe here in Warsaw holds the Foreign Investment Agency's file on Bila, which contains the company's proposal to said agency, the Polish government study of the proposed venture, and records from the Austrian Trade Registry Office detailing the histories of both Polmark and Bila. These documents reveal how the venture relied upon familiar narratives of commercial underdevelopment in the post-communist region, foregrounding Western firms and models as the best option for serving an ostensibly underserved populace. As enumerated in the proposal to the Foreign Investment Agency, Bila Poland's nominal goals were to improve the commercial infrastructure in Poland by installing supermarkets that would, quote, meet the needs of the population, end quote. While in Warsaw, I will also be able to consult records from the economic ministry's holdings on foreign trade in the 1980s and into the 2000s, allowing me to contextualize the Vila Poland venture within the larger history of Austro-Polish trade. To tell the story of Vila Poland itself, I use articles in the Polish press, which regularly commented on goings on at Vila, along with advertisements which the supermarket play placed in local newspapers. Another important source base is the public transcripts of one investigation into the post-socialist corruption allegations in which the Polmark founders were implicated. The investigation into the Polish oil refiner PKN Orlens, which took place in 2004 and 2005. In the course of the investigation, Zagiel Kuna and a number of their associates gave testimony detailing their economic activities in Poland over the preceding few decades. Although by no means a central concern of these proceedings, the frequent references to Bila contained in these documents again help us understand how various actors from those directly involved to external commentators came to perceive foreign supermarkets within a larger context of disillusionment and economic mistrust in the mid 1990s. Similarly, 
European Union documents on Biele's acquisition by the German supermarket chain Reva in 1996 and press discourse surrounding Reva's subsequent sale of its Biele holdings in Poland, which some commentators attributed to disagreements between Reva and Polmark, help illuminate the implications of retail expansion into Eastern Europe for larger understandings of Europe in the lead up to formal integration. In part, this dissertation argues that the transformative impact of supermarkets such as Bila should not be underestimated, even in pursuit of a more nuanced depiction of the purported rupture of 1989 from the perspective of everyday life. As many friends and colleagues have impressed upon me, while Polish consumers prior to 1989 did have access to self-service shopping and at times to a variety of domestic and foreign goods, the sheer scale of these shops' sales space and inventory represented a significant change, as did their peripheral setting outside of city centers, their designers' proclivity for larger shopping halls conducted on a weekly rather than daily basis, and the highly technologized shopping experience offered there. The focus of my analysis, however, is on the ideas about belonging, borders and the changing east-west connection in contemporary Europe that were reified in these interactions. As one Bila advertisement announced to Varsovian shoppers in the lead up to its first store opening in December 1990, pre-Christmas shopping in Vienna? Why not? You don't have to travel abroad for this anymore. We came to you. Thank you very much. Dziękuję bardzo. Chciałam jeszcze spytać naszą prelegentkę o źródło jej zainteresowań naukowych. Zrobię to w języku angielskim, ponieważ prezentacja była bardzo ciekawa i też bogata w różnego rodzaju materiały źródłowe, zarówno tutaj z jednej strony literatura, ale właśnie z drugiej strony też widzieliśmy szerokie użycie źródeł i to też polskojęzycznych, a także prasy. Więc teraz bardzo Państwa przepraszam, ale zwrócę się w języku angielskim do naszej prelegentki. Um, Lia, thank you. It was really impressing, I mean, your presentation. Um, uh, what, what, what impressed me most was the fact that you use not only like literature and also Polish speaking literature, but also press. So Polish speaking press from 1990s and the archives, I understand that you are now uh, visiting various archives and also. Um, I wanted to ask how do you, did you came up with the idea to explore this topic, because on the one hand it is very interesting, and on the other hand I think that it is not uh, very much explored. Um, especially abroad, I mean, uh, outside of Poland. So uh, I wonder what is the source of this um, uh, research, if you could just tell us something more about it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. In one sense, I think this topic is Um, unpopular among Anglo-American researchers or researchers in, in Western Europe and North America more generally, because the post-socialist or post-communist period is only beginning to get attention from historians um, in that part of the world. There's a real sort of sense that the historical inquiry ended in 89-91, but, but clearly even in a geopolitical sense today, we are seeing that much happened <laughs> after 1989. Um, so increasingly, people are starting to tell that story. In the same sense, I think that uh, Western European and to a certain extent, American researchers aren't comfortable um, writing histories of corporations with, with which they are familiar, where they shop themselves on a daily basis. Um, in part because it's a quite a messy story. And that's really the answer to your question is the, the messiness of all of this is what brought me to this subject. Uh, I was in Bucharest, Romania in 2014 and going grocery shopping as we all must do. And the uh, one of the largest supermarket chains in Romania, Mega Image, which is 
it's been owned by a variety of, of Western European chains over its tenure in Romania, but um, it currently is owned by the same chain, which owns uh, the Food Lion supermarket chain, which is a relatively small supermarket chain in the southern southeastern United States, but one with, with which I am quite familiar. And it really interested me to see that these same logos could be on the same supermarkets, despite the contents of the aisles being quite different. Uh, we often talk about globalization as really homogenizing, that we suddenly all the uh, same products are available in Polish stores, as are in German stores, as are in American stores. But in fact, there is still heterogeneity because even in a standardized supermarket model, retailers do market research to figure out what consumers are going to buy. And so figuring out some of those differences and what sort of cultural assumptions come with those retail decisions, which we like like to think of as rational and neutral, but are in fact quite um, quite culturally situated. That's sort of the origin point of the research. Uh, thank you. So I understand that you explore not only Poland, but also the other countries of the uh, like Central and Eastern Europe and which ones, uh, which exactly, uh, which countries uh, do you focus on uh, apart from Poland? The other two countries are East Germany, former East Germany, and, and Romania. Um, and in part, those, those choices are logistical. Those are the languages that I can read. Um, in part, they, they make sense because um, these are three, the three largest of the Soviet so-called satellite countries. So they encompass quite a large portion of the population in the post-socialist region. But they also offer us a few things in terms of urban history, which I didn't highlight so much in this talk, but telling the story of supermarkets is very um, geographic in nature. And we often see that supermarkets come to urban centers first. That was true in Poland, but the first Bila supermarket was in Warsaw, but it was in Praga. It was not in the center of Warsaw, which is because supermarkets are large and they need large parking lots. They need quite a lot of space. And so this sort of tension between urban and suburban space um, has led me to focus more and more on post-socialist cities as a sort of category of analysis. And Berlin, Bucharest, and Warsaw are quite different from somewhere like, for example, Budapest or, or Prague, um, which have a very different kind of tourism, a very different kind of identity. Uh, their landscapes are much, uh, were not so quite as comprehensively changed in the second half of the 20, 20th century. Um, and so there are particular opportunities in talking about the German, Polish, and Romanian capitals that allow me not only geographic breadth to tell a much larger regional story, um, but also have some commonalities that allow us to really interrogate the urban history dimension of, of the supermarket expansion process. Uh what is interesting, what intrigues me is the fact that this topic actually at like um, encompasses history, modern history, for example, when we talk about Poland, so it concerns history after 1989, uh, so the time of my childhood, to be, to be, to be frank, but also economy, so it's uh, like many, many different uh, fields of knowledge which are concerned, and this is fascinating, I, I think. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you uh, what are your, your like projects, plans concerning your stay in Poland, and if you, uh, if you are going to go to the two other countries to make research, so um, what are, you know, what, what you did manage to, to do already and what are the next steps as far as your research is concerned? Yes, yes. thank you. Um, you're certainly right that the project takes both economy and an economic history approach and a cultural history approach. And I think that that is one of the most important stories of post-socialist reform of transformation is that all of those economic ideas had cultural significance um, that, and yet those are often separated by virtue of strict uh, disciplines and sub-disciplines such as economic history, such as cultural history that tend to separate those things. And one of my goals is to integrate them um, more 
more than they have been in the past. So Poland is my last stop on a nine month research trip this year. I spent the first three months, September, October, and November in Berlin, um, as well as around Germany, looking at a, very, a variety of archives and libraries there. And then I was in Bucharest um, in December, January, and, and February. So I've, those, I've already done those research trips. Um, and this is my last stop. While in Warsaw, I'm mostly going to be at the National Library because I was able to order many of the archival files online. Um, and so the periodicals and other things that can't be digitized or are much larger and take longer to go through. Um, that's the, the plan for most of the time that I'm here. So I'm working in the National Library as well as in the, um, the Economic School Library. Um. Thank you, Leah. I think that uh, what you already did is really impressing. And I hope that um, we will have an opportunity to meet once again as soon as you just finish your research so that you could present us also uh, the other questions and other mothers, mothers which uh, it just takes into account. Uh, so thank you once again. I will now switch into Polish, sorry. Szanowni Państwo, mieliśmy okazję wysłuchać tutaj bardzo ciekawej prezentacji. Tak jak wspomniała nasza prelegentka, jest to formuła dzisiaj nieco skrócona, ponieważ tak naprawdę badania są w toku i, i właściwie są to na razie takie początkowe wnioski badawcze. Również temat także został zawężony na potrzeby dzisiejszego seminarium, ponieważ prelegentka zajmuje się Niemcami Wschodnimi, Rumunią i Polską. Dzisiaj skupiliśmy się na Polsce. Mam nadzieję, że będziemy mieli okazję za jakiś czas gościć prelegentkę ponownie, wtedy kiedy już przedstawi nam w takiej formule bardziej obszernej wyniki swoich badań z koreferentem. Tymczasem nasze dzisiejsze spotkanie dobiega końca, ale chciałam Państwa jeszcze serdecznie zaprosić na kolejne seminarium naukowe za tydzień, a więc 30 marca tradycyjnie o godzinie 12 będziemy gościć doktora habilitowanego Władysława Bułhaka z Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej, który zaprezentuje temat wywiad PRL a Watykan w latach 1962-1978. Jego koreferentem będzie dr Witold Bagieński z Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej, a więc już teraz serdecznie Państwa zapraszam na to spotkanie. Tymczasem jeszcze raz dziękuję naszej prelegentce oraz wszystkim uczestnikom. Życzę Państwu wszelkiej pomyślności, przede wszystkim dużo zdrowia i do zobaczenia.